Because <laughs> every week I've been in there, it'd be somebody new having the responsibilities for guiding and assisting and facilitating the group. And that has a way of, in the best organized way, of sustaining consistency. Surely, if it be that Martin King was the one, or Elijah Muhammad was the one, or Marcus Garvey was the one, surely as they could identify the one, they would have made preparations laying at two, three, or four to be the next one if you play the one game with them. I remember the old uh, movie Dance with Wolves where they used to sit in a circle much in duplication of you, the original circular decision makers. No decision was made linearly in a straight line, up, down, or straight sideways. You were the people who saw the come around, go around, the reap what you sow, the cause and effects. That was your understanding about the world and it was deviated by another group that saw it from top down. That I will conquer you because we believe in individual leadership and solo responsibility. So as we kick around the subject, uh, we're going to uh, be able to use the overhead a little bit tonight. I uh, brought some material that I think will assist us. On our way. Uh, don't forget, of course, uh, Friday night we'll be having the fundraiser here uh, at 7 o'clock. Told Sister Janie, so far we have zero commitments. So cook about 10 dinners. Where's Sister at? She still in here? There she is. Yeah, you got about, you think you got about 10 dinners worth? No, yeah. <laughs> okay, that'll be Friday night. And then don't forget the AMU uh, program on Saturday, as uh, uh, Brother Nkrumah had mentioned earlier. Uh, listen out uh, for some uh, new lectures uh, upcoming. Uh, one called Boulay 1993, Africa 1993, and Black Jewish Relations 1993 with an ADL kicker. In fact, that flyer has a little boot with the letters ADL being kicked right out the page. <laughs> part of what part of what a consensus inhibits is individuals opportunity to negate or undermine the strength of the group and sometimes these are done by personal motivation personal motivations predominant aspect or indicator is money and I was talking Saturday out here in Pasadena about a little concept I was working on called white knowledge, which dealt with things that the white people do that just articulate that they are superior and that we are inferior and we accept these positions for no other reason than we got paid to. And one of the examples I shared with the little kids who are primary importance and the counterattack on our community is about that commercial with Michael Jordan and Larry Bird. Y'all seen that commercial? Nothing but that. Yeah, this is the commercial where Michael Jordan is sitting on the bench. Larry Bird walks in. Say, what you got there, Michael? He said, oh, Big Mac. He said, I'll play you for it. And they start going on the top of the garage, off the rim, off the backboard, off the ceiling, over the expressway, and all that stuff. You seen that? Yeah. Well, I always ask the children, if you watch it carefully, say, what does Michael Jordan win if he succeeds in defeating Larry Bird's challenge? No. Nothing. Uh, and that's white knowledge. <laughs> Make you play for your own sandwich. <laughs> Let's do that. And the only reason Michael Jordan did it was because he got paid to. But that sets our children up to be a chump. 
to make us think somebody could challenge us for something we already have. And that's our problem. We keep starting from the wrong position. And we accept every other position from that position on puts us in the down slot. So if he had to check in, he would make such a mistake. People would proofread the images that he portrayed so that he wouldn't deviate. I mentioned the other night about the concept of an emerging dominant cadre. Part of what has happened is, is that you can do those things that make the race look like a chump because there's no penalty. Of course, we've talked long about retribution and dealing with uh, uh, attacking those who have attacked us. But in reality, again, that's no one's job. And two, no one really sizes it up so that everybody could get a mass understanding of what's really going on. And actually, the children are the ones get most confused. So we gotta put a little bow in there and start to uh, get, excuse me, get a little more aggressive uh, in dealing with these deviations. And I suggest some of the things I'm gonna share with you about what happened to Marcus Garvey. The best thing I can see as I study this thing over and over again, even some things I learned since I was just here the other night, is that there's a vein where a group says that if you just stop doing what you're doing, well, all the rest of us will be okay. But if you keep doing that, you're going to get us all in trouble. And I know Brother Marcus is going to go through that now at KPFK. Because this attack on Koiku, Lynn, and Liberation Weekend, over three days out of 52 weekends, through one weekend out of 52, is not what the white folks are arguing about. The apparent trade-off in the oven is if you can drop Steve Coakley, we'll bring Kwaku back. And that will work if you go along with it and if Kwaku go along with it. I know Marcus ain't going to buy it. He's already made his affirmation. He ain't going for it. And that's been in the source of last time I was here. We talked, looked at a memorandum that had been written by one of the program assistants there which alleged that she was unable to control Coakley on the air and that that was a punishable penalty of being given an assignment in a white institution and being un unable to control an identified troublemaker. So now it is not that I will ever be in or they could ever convince me, but they don't have to if the others around me go for it. All right, all right. So I'm proud to say that I know Marcus is not going to crack. But I know there are some others there, around there, that are going to come out to you one evening. And it's going to happen quietly around Los Angeles. And you watch who bears the word. That we got to save Quake Koo at all costs. Which means, all costs means we may have to sacrifice something for it. Now, Kwaku is an honorable brother, and he deserves to be supported, and it's no deal of his either or, because in this team thing, it's neither nor. They don't go but one way. But everybody in, this, in the circle ain't committed themselves. So I throw out there to you an example, which may come to be your first evidence of the emergence of this dominant cadre that's not going to allow a certain level of deviation based upon an individualistic ambition. It is not that I offer anything, but there may come some tougher than me who will have no spot if I have no spot. And so I don't want to see you sell yourself short on no Coakley and sell yourself out of Garvey's or Malcolm's or anyone else's children's children's spirit that may emerge within a community that is as conscious as it has ever been in its history in this country, ever. Which means we got strong spout coming. And if you don't carve a spot for the spout, what Reverend Butts is doing at Abacena Baptist Church out of New York in taking an assignment to attack 
certain forms of rock music, rap music, and step over Rockefeller, whose office is no more than 20 blocks from his church, is to come out with a, pro, a faulty prioritization of where our most pressing problems lie. And these things, these false computations, can continue. In that lecture, Attack on Rap Leadership, right in this room, when the iced tea thing was on the table, we said, if the brother bucks down and drops that song, everybody else on the line gonna get bit. And he cut a deal to maintain a relationship that had him withdraw the song. And I'm going to tell you, he was at University of Maryland. He did not pass out cop killer like he said he would. He's been in a lot of other places. He did not pass out the song. And other groups immediately at Warner Brothers, including the lynch mob, who had made contact with me, were being forced to take records out of their albums based upon the president that the brother bucked down. So now it may not be that the remedy to the attack on black leadership is solely upon our counterattack to the whites. But we will cut down on the whites' options by consolidating our own power bases. So that this counterattack, in fact, Sister told me that she seen Halle Berry on one of them commercials promoting the spy project called Neighbor to Neighbor, which means that somebody may call out Brother Ed's name because they hear the tapes playing through his window. And the tapes are saying mf and Huck the White Man and this and that. And it might be me on the tape. Somebody may call Ed out as a potential disturber of the peace, which is white domination. And he might get identified in the neighbor to neighbor program and Holly Berry might have been just enough to convince someone that it was okay to do it. Having just run him off of that program with Alex Haley, Queen, which was deep. <laughs> and her and Jasmine Guy went on the tour about being a little white ain't all bad. <laughs> but it's damn near as bad as being all white. <laughs> so, it becomes a fact that we're going to start in certain sorts of ways of pushing out the deviations a little bit more, a little bit more aggressively. Uh, I have decided, uh, as uh, some of the tapes uh, we'll hear in the next couple of days as I play things back for you, uh, is that uh, we're not going to take any longer the disrespect that we receive from our own community who, instead of congratulates us for service, uh, identifies us as troublemakers. Uh, I told you about uh, being here and speaking at AME Church, uh, there for the black men's group, and uh, having 80 black men there put about $400 in the hat and having somebody hand me 120 of that saying that's all I deserve and taking the rest and throwing it back in the church with the other four four million dollars that he gets a year uh, but 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 the only point is is that's all right they can do those things when the word doesn't go out that you don't hit back and that's 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 the suggestion that we're not going to allow and uh, we're gonna hear a report from some brothers about uh, the uh, demonstration that went down today uh, at the ADL, of which uh, there were none, there were no uh, displays of that on uh, public television. I didn't see it on any news as I watched all the stations uh, in preparation for coming here. Um, Africa is under attack, and we're going to be talking about that in a lecture called Africa 93. Sister Janie, uh, in your spare time, could you check and see if next Tuesday, a week from tonight, and next Friday, a week from Friday night, are available dates at the Good Life? So that I could tell them about the other lectures that are coming up, which I'm going to touch on now. In the Africa 1993 update, well, we're going to look at Africa under attack. 
Uh, I'm going to play for you uh, Jesse Jackson speaking at Trans Africa, uh, where he calls for the G7 to have a meeting in Africa uh, in the context of never explaining G7 to his community. And uh, the G7, of course, is an offshoot of the International Economic Summits, which, of course, are a direct offshoot of the Trilateral Commission. And we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, up during that time, as well as about that Shaft in Africa meeting. Now, what the Shaft in Africa meeting has showed me beyond a doubt, uh, on Saturday, and there's a brother here in this room who did some outstanding research, and really, his research was persistence. He heard someone on the radio mention that certain information was available for free. It was the brochure, as well as an, uh, the sponsoring private group that set up the second annual African-American summit in Gabon, Africa. And on Saturday at the AMU meeting, the brother brought forth the documentation and I want to tell you for a fact, when I stood here and told you about Shaft in Africa, it was worse than that. What this brother has shown with the brochure, you'll see the brochure open it up, Mobile Oil, Chevron, RJR Nabisco, Gillette, Coca-Cola, IBM, every single page in the brochure of the African American Summit had white corporate leaders, full page ads, in the, and the only thing that wasn't theirs, because there were about 15 pages of theirs, and two pages for the brothers, which had the itinerary. In the shaft goes the Africa meeting. Also what the brothers showed, which will stun your butt, now, and I hope to do this lecture a week from the night. It'll be a week from the night, Africa 93, and we're going to look at Mandela, Winnie Mandela, the settlement of the government, the PAC, what's going on all in Africa, the attempts to recolonize Africa. Uh, there's a whole spot full of African stuff going on now. And you're at your weakest moment in assisting Africa based upon not only lack of resources, but deprivation of information. And then they have brought in the have a little want some more leadership cadre to supplant your African attempt uh, with the white problem on their back for solution time. See, you could bring Mobile Oil to Africa if you didn't know that Mobile, all the time they was doing anti-apartheid stuff, was the largest corporation from America in South Africa was Mobile Oil. You never heard about that because Rockefeller took his money and gave it to his agent, Randall Robinson. And he went out and let a anti-Royal Dutch Shell boycott, which you did hear about, didn't you? But you didn't hear about Mobile. And Royal Dutch Shell is headquarters in the Netherlands. Attack someone you can't reach, but protect the one who is the one who is hidden by paying other people to misdirect the real attack system. See, we are get confused about the attack. We don't know sometimes when you're being given something, you're being attacked. It might be that that weakens your resistance to further attack. It could be money. In the church, attacks are usually led about rumor. In the church, a rumor is a powerful commodity. Much more powerful than fact, because you've got a speculation science. <laughs> so in that arena, fact is not an argument. Rumor, speculation, the pastor sleeping with Billy Joe Mama, can ruin a man instantaneously. In politics, it might be a different type of ingredient. But the knowledge of it is, is that every mode of leadership has a vein of attack. And so, in the religious community, it, it may be innuendo and rumor. In the political community, you saw a Congressman Harold Ford just come out of a court case. You got Austin Hastings just coming out of a court case, having been attacked 
by another member of the own black caucus, John Conyers, who for years has had the impression of being a socially conscious congressman. But he led the attack on Austin Hastings to find him guilty in a court case before the House, which in fact duplicated a legal court case which was kicked out by a judge. The only point of it is, is that when the white man didn't beat him, they sent the black man to block him. And that's important because that's the left-right combination. We be up on that. There's another man named Gus Savage who, who was attacked for many reasons. One of them, myself. Any of you who have that ADL report on bigotry will see that one of the reasons he was attacked in the article was for giving support to Steve Coakley. And you can imagine a man representing as many people as a congressman does having to be attacked for supporting a constituent who supports his community. He's attacked also for his support of the Nation of Islam. Again, an institution within his own community. And that only revolves around that many of the attacks that we'll see if this comes out this is a little light article uh, let's see here uh, well we can tighten this up it's like it fell a little bit is this affecting something I hear something uh, Let me see if I can just stick it up back there. I might I don't know why. Need some tape up there. All right. Might need more than that tape. I might need to stick it down. Why you, you off? Yeah. Just you can stand up there. Huh? Just you can stand up there. Uh, we'll see. Uh, right, can you make it up there, brother? Yeah, the chair. You can stand up there. Okay. And let me see something. I might just bring it down. Let me see something. Uh, I'll read you the date off the actual copy. Friday, August something. Uh, talking about the attack on Gus Savage, it says that the person who was used against Gus Savage was Ron Brown, head of the Democratic National Committee at that time. Of course, we know him as Boule Brown. In fact, <laughs> Gus Savage said his name really is Ron Beige. Right, right there, my finger is on the word Beige. He said his name is Ron Beige. <laughs> but Gus is a, is a good brother, and... Uh, It'd be good to get Gus out here to speak, to tell you about the Congress. So uh, Gus was one of the few congressmen who consistently voted against Jewish issues. In the caucus, when there were 22 or 24 members, it would be 1 to 23 every time. And then Augustus Hawkins, right before he started to go, stopped voting against the Jewish vote. He was 80, 84, and felt he ought to at least do it before he died. Uh, and... Uh, there's a name right down here that's uh, mentioned in the Gus Savage uh, attack here. And actually, I guess that makes it even harder to see. Uh, and the name is, uh, is that right? Can you make it without the light? The name is uh, right here at the bottom. It's called uh, Ron Emanuel. Uh, he's a Jewish guy. And he... Uh, led the attack uh, for the Democratic Party against Gus Savage, of which they ran a Rhodes Scholar named Mel Reynolds against him. And he chaired Mel Reynolds' committee. This is about uh, this guy hooking with Mel Reynolds to chair his committee for Richard Daly to lead the fight against Gus Savage. But it says, Emmanuel is M E M N E M. M A N U E L. You need to remember the name because he's the chief political advisor to President Clinton now. Uh, Said that he also led the attack on somebody you might remember, a congressman named Paul Finley. In the book, They Dare Speak Out, you'll see a profile of this young white boy. Uh, oh, yeah, thanks. This is the point. 
<laughs> Crowd pleaser. <laughs> Moment beater. Uh, this is his name here. That he uh, got his spurs attacking Paul Finley, who was being thrown out of office for meeting with the PLO. Mm. And so, what I'm going to show, what I'm saying by showing this is that attacking our servitude squad sometimes could lead to promotion for the opposition. So in other words, sometimes they may be impartial about the attack. I will kill off Yahweh bin Yahweh if I can. I don't even know what he's up to. But if you'll promote me for doing it. Now the crowd that may ask you to do it may in fact have these precise modifications for wanting it done. Uh, his his uh, religious beliefs are too strong for us. Uh, his economic development program is too successful for us. Uh, but the person who may be the person to do it may have no other loyalty to the issue other than the guarantee of something, which means slash strategy. We must have, we have to beat down the amount of gain one can secure for crossing the servitude squad. Right. In other words, we have to diminish the ability of the opposition to reward for attack. Because without reward, there are few psychologically motivated friends of the enemy. Meaning that he gets most of his followers for loyalty based upon might and persuasion of money and force. Not because of belief. Ain't no, I so believe in you, I'm going to go do this for you. Because they all get paid. They never do it for free. And they have to pay their believers. But you got shooting, camera shooting bullets and shit. So, uh, everything all right? So, uh, we, uh, we, uh, must, we must, in stopping the attack, beat down the reward system. So if, uh, if uh, Saunders is told, if you support Ridden, we'll reward you, you have to be able to diminish the reward system. Now, it's not, again, the analogy is not fair because Wu was not an alternative. Who spied on me right here in this room as chairman of the Human Relations Commission? Right here, when I first came here. In fact, they were here spying the day we did the fundraiser for the sisters of South Central. When we raised $400 for the sister, right here we had a little fundraiser here on a Sunday afternoon. And they were here, we had an argument right outside there by the phone. Over, over, uh, them coming to spot the meeting out. Now, we have felt, let me see here. That the attack on the political leadership, you go through Bradley, Dinkins, Good, Wilder, Washington, etc., you will find that it is not difficult to box in a black mayor whose responsibilities uh, compel him to supervise white things. And because of that, the utilities, uh, phone, electric, gas, light, municipal finance, are beyond the leverage capability of a black man to offset them. They continuously find themselves in unfortunate positions. And we could easily see, like, you can see this, white police officers call black mayor nigger. This is uh, Deacons, who was called a nigger. 10,000 white boys walked on his office. When they walked, they was mad because he was asking to develop a police, uh, uh, what they call it, we got it in Chicago, a police oversight body. Uh, uh, a board, a police board, a police commission, like the one ex-CIA Schomburg, Schomburg, whatever his name is, that runs here in L.A. You know he is ex-CIA, don't you? 
You know he ex CIA, don't you? You do know he's ex CIA, don't you? He's the head of the police commission here in Los Angeles. Sean, what's his name? Sean Baum. Yeah, he's ex CIA. That ran right here in your LA paper. Now, <clears throat> all throughout the story, during the protest, city council member Una Clark of Brooklyn said she was called a nigger as she tried to enter City Hall. A major network news a cameraman, John Haygood, said he also was called a nigger as he attempted to cover the story. They were covering the story of police. These was the New York police. Now, Dinkins got real mad at him. And as I mentioned, he then went out and got a new police chief and made him a white man. <laughs> to show he was really upset. Oops, I'm sorry, I won't hit the paint. So he was really upset. But it only goes to show you that you can't stand them up to us as some sort of reward. What I saw when I studied about Garvey, and we talked about it the other week, was that it was very important for whites to offer to blacks a prototype of behavior or success, and the phenomena of the black mayors or overseers were to tell the black masses that they had in fact arrived. And I thought it was interesting that in this story attacking me from Taylor Branch, which ran in Esquire in 89, reprinted in uh, this book, Bridges and Boundaries, by Black Jewish Relations, put out by the Rockefeller Foundation, Ford Foundation, all the people I hate, all the people I talk against, uh, are here talking against me, fair game, and <laughs> <laughs> but then I'm going to show you who the contributors are who they said one of the most important things in putting this book together was to get a list of people who to get a list of people who would endorse what we were doing they didn't, they didn't have control of what we were doing but they endorsed what we were doing so the perception was fed to the people that we were doing it together you see if you're going to attack Steve Coakley, don't nobody want to be the leader. Because Coakley bop you on that ass. And usually the head man gets it first. And we hit. They know we hit. There's no doubt about it. They know we hit. And we get some good hits in. And, and, so you go get a posse. A whole page full of people. Now this story attacks me, but it attacks our race, saying that blacks had to wait on Alex Haley to, to write roots to learn of their history, while Jewish people had the Torah. It said things like that, to personify the dumbness of the story. But it had to get a list of people to get them to affirm the attack. You see, if they can get me in a certain precondition, then the precondition is the prelude to another level of attack based upon my apparent weakness. And so, to go get a posse, now this is a, this is a touring exhibit, this is going city to city. A museum, this is a museum exhibit, for the whole one-fifth of the book is anti-Steve Coakley. The rest of it is history about how they attacked and defeated Marcus Garvey, about black Jewish relationships, about SNCC and black Jewish relationships, about the NAACP, the Urban League, and Jewish control, etc., etc., etc. The only real uh, current attack in the book is the Copley portion. So I ain't gonna sleep it. And then not beat the ones I see standing around it. Like Julius Chambers, Director, Council, National Association of the Advancement of Colored People's Legal Defense and Education Fund. Mayor David Dinkins, Mary Wright Edelman, Dorothy Height, Ben Hooks, Vernon Jordan, John Lewis, 
Eleanor Holmes Norton, Eddie Williams of the Joint Center for Political Studies, Percy Sutton, who twice denied me the right to be on his radio station from the Apollo Theater, all in the middle of the black community. Couldn't have Steve Coakley on his radio show, LIB, with Gary Byrd, because Mayor Dinkins called Sutton, and Sutton called the program director, and I was canceled for being too anti-white. What happened this morning? Yeah, that's a good one. I'm sure some of you all got up. Y'all probably fall asleep before the night is over because you've been up early. They, well, tell them, bro, what they say. Maybe next week. You see that? Maybe next week. <laughs> At the all black Stevie Wonder station. That says now they're too... First they said they could do it on a Tuesday. Then they said, oh, he's still here. Well, we'll make it a week. They're supposed to leave next Monday, right? So they said, we'll make it next Tuesday. So the day I changed my plane tickets to the next Tuesday. So, so, because we value the opportunity, and since that made the best excuse for me not being on, Sister and I paid $50 this morning at 7 a.m., waiting on the line to change them plane tickets at our own expense, to get the right to go on to get some more abuse thrown at us. So that's why we're going to have more lectures here is because we're going to suck up this excuse because we got to have the Stevie Wonder, are you with us or not? <laughs> Sheet of paper. Now, I know, uh, what did they talk about today? Nothing. Huh? Alcoholism. 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 Knowing the alcoholics just went to bed. <laughs> you know about them up at five, ain't drinking no whiskey, right? So you got zero population base. That's good. Hey. Another big move for the station. <laughs> so we're gonna see what what becomes of Brother Coakley's opportunity. Now, it's interesting that I mentioned the black press. Just for an example, I want to show you something, just as deviation. The attack on the real community has been contained by the little opportunity we have to hear about it from our own press. You know, I was thinking about it. When we did the story about the boule, when the first story of the boule came out, which is that one, which yeah. appeared in the LA Times. Uh-oh. Did I hit you, you still in? When we did, when that first story came out, that was July 18th, 1990, which we looked at right here. This is the first story about Sigma Pi Phi. That meant to us that the LA Times already knew about the boule. We didn't, but they already knew. And that was important because the boule, as I'm gonna show you, was primarily responsible for attacking Marcus Garvey but what protected their attack was that the whites refused to write about the attack. See, they like to play up black on black crime. Yeah. But not white inspired black on black leadership servitude dialogue. See, you see what I'm saying? They do the black on black thing, but not under the certain things. Mm -hmm. Certain things are off of discussion because that's a plan or a plot and not an incident. It's a series of things. So we know the LA Times knew about the story. And then when I got to Washington in November, this story appeared in November 4 of 91. We found that story in the Washington Post where obviously they knew about the boule. They were talking about Wilder getting money for his campaign from the guardsmen. We need to have a discussion about the guardsmen. When I was on the board of the NAACP in Chicago, they had a chairman called Chairman of the Club Set. There were 40 or 50 black men and women's clubs. The Lynx, Chad, y'all better watch them Lynx. Don't slip, don't sleep the Lynx. 
They like the woman boule. Don't sleep it. We're going to have a new piece coming out on the links. The four horsemen, the guardsmen, the snakesmen. They got all kind of stuff going. You better find out about these clubs because outside of small little press releases in the black press, you never hear what they do. And they make up the consensus behind the scenes about the containment. You see, the whites don't seek to stifle black leadership, they just seek to contain it. So that how do you allow a person to speak but say nothing? Becomes a strategy. This is you become proficient in this. So we know, says that the Boulay and Greek letter societies represent the infrastructure of black America. The fraternal dynamic that permeates the black community. Now the white man wrote this. That it represents the infrastructure. Remember the Boulay calls itself the inner circle of our race. Which means that when Du Bois introduces the concept of the talented tenth, what it really was Talented tenth only. <laughs> now, if you don't understand that, what only means, it means exclusively just us. And it means that the guarantee is that in spite of or in deference to 11 on down. Mm. This, is a, this is a policy that they cannot break. So we know that they knew about it. So it was no news to them. And then we start finding these around the country. This is the black newspaper in Washington, D.C., the Washington Afro-American, with a uh, 1992 story dated uh, January 11th, 1992, talking about Epsilon Boulay Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity Annual Dinner Dance. And it runs down all this, and it says, continue success to all the members of the area Boule, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. They had a meeting together, all three of them. D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. In two hours, you can go from Richmond, Virginia, through D.C., down there up to Baltimore, Maryland. So you got three states you can quickly get to. And this list says there was approximately 65 members at the D.C. Boule. Some of them, some of them are our host, Samuel Massey, Grand, Rep Carcer, us or something, Hardy Franklin, Carl Anderson, blah, blah, blank, 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 Wesley Brown, George Weaver, blah, 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 blah. It says here that uh, Vernon Jordan, it was Attorney Jordan and his lovely wife, Anne, who was white, <laughs> uh -huh. who invited Mayor, Mayor Sharon Pratt Kelly and her husband that evening. The newlyweds had just returned from their honeymoon. It was a real pleasure to see them so soon after the surprise Neptos. We wish them much happiness. <laughs> but the point of it is, is that the kiss off to the boule is that of positiveness. So the question becomes, since they had never wrote a critical story of the boule, then the supposition is, is that the boule's history, what they have amounted to, what they are, is worth emulation and success as opposed to analysis and condemnation. A value judgment has been made that we weren't a part of, and the conclusion is they have hidden their whereabouts from us on an honest level and confined our dialogue to things that didn't include them when they looked at the power dynamic, when in fact in the power dynamic they are the primary consulted ones from the white race. I'm doing my best. Now this is of course, this is of course Jet Magazine, which in August is announcing the new head of the boule being put in. And I see, you're just looking at it, you don't, don't even see boule. Which means you gotta read into stuff, everything, every little picture, flip, flop, everything. You gotta have some way of grabbing your attention. 41st, show you right, man. The 41st Bayano Grand Boule of Sigma Pi Phi Fraternity convened in the plush. What we know about every time they meet, it's always plush. It's always plush. Western, Western Crown Center, Hotel in Kansas City, Missouri. The immediate past grandsire Sire Archon Benjamin Mayor of Oakland passed the gavel to the new grandsire Archon Hugh D. Perkins of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. 
African Americans working together for progress was the theme. <laughs> well, how can we have progress when we haven't met? <laughs> was the theme of the boule. Roy Roberts, manufacturing manager of General Motors Corporation, was the dynamic keynote speaker. An evening dinner lecture on the history of the Kansas City Jazz, an enjoyable picnic where more than 784 archons, that's 19, 7, 8, and 4, no arbitrary number, Archons and their families feasted on the delectable, famous Gages and Sons barbecue. <laughs> were among the boule highlights. That was the highlight. Accolades were heaped upon the general chairman, Elmer Jackson Jr., and his state of boule of Kansas City Archons and Archhouses, which is the wives. Now that means, of course, not only is John Johnson a boule, but that he's known about it. He can report to us more about it. Mm -hmm. But in fact, again, the dialogue is about platitude. Here's another one. Found this one in the New York Amsterdam News. The Amsterdam News is a brother who came out who was being attacked by the New York Post. Everybody really loved the brother uh, for coming out and counterattacking, for being attacked in the New York Post. Uh, I forget the brother's name, uh, Tate, uh, no, not Tate, uh, uh, brother, uh, the brother, the head of the Amsterdam News, he was on Nightline one night, Tatum, Tatum, there we go, Tatum, that's it, brother Tatum, and this is his newspaper in New York, and uh, he also was the first black press to do the ADL story in New York, uh, which is uh, very amiable, and uh, here is in his paper, uh, given honor uh, at the invitation of the three metropolitan and suburban chapters of the Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, many uh, something, a very enjoyable animal Christmas party was held at the Holiday Inn Crown Plaza. Well, it's interesting, they got two crowns. It meant the crown in Kansas City, and the crown is the crown family who uh, owns General Dynamics. Uh, big time Jewish people who have attacked me personally. Uh, Sigma Pi Phi, which was founded in 1904, first letter, a uh, Greek letter, fraternity of African Americans in this country. The host chapters, it lists them. It lists some of the people who were there, judges, um, the Mayor Dinkins and all of that. Say annual party draws, distinguished guests. Of course, there's no hint of adversion in the story, but it only means that even though the brother at the Amsterdam was good in the fight, it did not, in fact, expose what it could have. Now, we were here just the other night, and we talked about this. This was our subject matter. We talked about that. Army Black Spy Network dates back to 1917. And, of course, in that story, we said that on May 3rd, 1917, that Secretary of War Newton D. Baker ordered Von Deman. So we got Newton Baker ordered Von Deman head of the Military Intelligence Division. It also said to set up the Army Spy Network against blacks. It also said again that his assistant to Newton Baker, Baker's special assistant was Emmett Scott. And that Emmett Scott was a person that we wanted to look further at. And what we learned by looking at Emmett Scott was that he was a Boule member. In fact, when this story broke, and even though the black press was redoing the story without a theme, they couldn't go do without you. I went and got my boule list in my boule book. And you see number 20 right there. Emmett Scott. This is listing who the boule members were in Washington, D.C. in the early uh, 1900s. I'm sorry, in front, in front of somebody. And sister will tell you how excited I got when they dropped that army spy story, and I then put my theme over it, and lo and behold, bingo, pops out the boule man. Now the question becomes, are the other people who appear in the story patterned similarly after him? Remember, there were other people in the story, which was our, our Moulton, Booker T's successor at Tuskegee, came aboard, as did C.B. Ronan of Nashville, 
who sent Loving, the assistant to Von Demond, a list of potential black informants and troublemakers. Mm. That's boule action. That's boule action. It then says that Robert Church of Memphis, Tennessee, who's the first black millionaire in America, remember, the first black millionaire in America was a spy. Mm. He was one of the wealthiest men of the race, has put me in touch with one prominent colored man in each of the largest <laughs> southern cities. So he needed a network of prominent colored men to be available to provide to him the potential of identifying other troublemakers. So, when I was in the mayor's office in Chicago, I, unbeknownst to myself, was being flushed out by competing powers around the mayor who just happened to have been the head of the boule. I didn't know it then. I didn't have the damn grid to fit over what I was seeing. I, it was just any old attack to me. Just another old attack from a little faggot ex-government official. <laughs> Took it like any other attack. But little did I know that he had been working against me and had served white mayors for many years and had done more than inform for them. Which meant that the boule, to me, has been counted on by other people. And this story, Going back into the Army's Black Spy Network, now you walk in, you walk in to more people. You walk in Joel Spingard and W.E.B. Du Bois. Just walk them right into this picture here. And Du Bois takes his autobiography and dedicates it to Joel Spingard. Look in the first page. We talked about it last night. But then Joel Spingard gets revealed to have been a spy for military intelligence. Which means that Du Bois must have been, like the others were, a spy. Now, this is a picture of Emmett Scott. Just for the record, we can put it on the video. That's a picture of Emmett Scott. As right here in Los Angeles in 1941, at the Boulay meeting at Griffin Park. 30 years into his boule activity, Emmett Scott becomes the 11th Grand Sire Archon from 1941 to 1946, and most prominently leading them through the war years. Now this is the boule history book, keys us right up to the Memphis Commercial Appeal story. The selection of Emmett Scott as Grand Sire Archon was one of the singular events of Sigma Pi Phi's history, which had significance for its war relationships during these years. Excuse me, thank you. No live remote seller cast. No, no. <laughs> Come on, see. You know I'm on you. You know I'm on you. But I'm proud he came back. That's the brother that was shooting the pictures of night. He came back. We had a little talk. We, we feel much better. We'll be all right. We're okay. We'll be all right. It says here. Now listen to this now. Remember, this guy is a spy against black people. But instead of being demoted for being a spy against black people, he was made the king of the inner circle of our race. It says, in the years Archon Scott had served during World War I in the years 1917 to 1919 as special assistant to Secretary of War Newton Baker. He was also the author of a volume, The American Negro in the World War, which was a phenomenon, seeing that that was 40 years before Rosa Parks. To get a nigga to go fight, couldn't even pee in a white washroom? That's heavy. That's heavy. So we need to remember that. So, the black press could have told us in reviewing history like it does, and you know, black press does give you a lot of Negro history. Watch it carefully it gives you a lot of Negro history. Now we know they've given us the short eye history. Yeah. They, they could have they went deeper and explained better the real theme that held our history together. Our history, and Brother Marcus said something that was really an honor to me and not in a disrespect to anyone. He said, Steve, you know, there have been a lot of people looking at this Garvey thing, 
but I never heard this theme come back of proving Garvey being attacked from an organized group of white men, black men, whose loyalty was the white men. In other words, we've almost gotten it so tight that it could be criminal charges. Mm. Right. See, right. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's the evidence has weighed in so strong now that, that it wasn't just a catch. See, everybody always says, well, what did the boule do wrong? <laughs> no, I mean, that, that's a logical question. Well, what are you holding against it? And uh, that's, uh, huh? How about genocide? That's uh, assistance, what we call co-assistance to genocide. That's, that's, right. that's right, that's right. And then we be uh, up on that. <laughs> and of course, we remember we talked about the other night, and of course you can't see that at all. Now you won't be able to see it. But we talked about how they they utilized the Klan in the spy network. That they could always count on the Klan of keeping track on a nigga. So the army used the boule to spot out the troublemakers but use the Klan to spot the niggas. Now, what's the difference? You needed two different groups because the Klan didn't have enough money to spot out these niggas. Because they Klan couldn't go where these niggas had the privilege of being at, which was so close to the white man that the Klan couldn't get that close. So the Klan had to supervise po niggas. But that's, that's, that's about the way it broke down. And, and, and so that they had to sort it out about who got to do what. Now. We don't want to forget this. Now this is uh, how one man built an empire. And I'm going to blow that little chart up there for you. Up. Uh, let me see what I got to do here. I think I'm going to blow it up. Uh, don't look like it's going to get no better. But what that chart, chart tells you is how many chapters Marcus Garvey had in how many places. Cuba, 52 branches. Number of branches. Distribution of UNIA branches. Cuba, 52, Panama, 47, Trinidad, 30, Costa Rica, 21, Canada, 15, Jamaica, 11, Honduras, 8, South Africa, 8, British Guyana, 7, Colombia, 6, Dominican Republic, 5, Guatemala, 5, Nicaragua, 5, Barbados, 4, British Honduras, 4, Mexico, 4, Sierra Leone, 3, England, 3, Gold Coast, 2, Liberia, 2, Bahamas, 2. We have Yet, in the history, now this don't, this don't even include Harlem, Chicago, this ain't even concluding in the continent of so-called America, we have yet to come back that strong ever. That's right. And we ain't never really been told how deep brother was in. They have not told us how close Marcus Garvey got to the people we were after. They have never told us. Just like when we went through the Malcolm thing, we saw they never told us that Malcolm really did attack the Rockefellers. Right. And that Malcolm knew of the Boule, but he called him Big Six, Big Six. which was the best he could conceptualize because he didn't know the whole thing. But he still had a concept for a cohesive element of black men who are being used to compromise all other black people. Uh-huh. All right? Yeah. So, so, so we keep that in context. Now let's flip over here. I want to share with you um, something that about the Jewish involvement. Now, part of the reason that black leadership, so-called, is such a butter knife is that at a specific moment white people showed up and made a scientific decision that we have to get in the front of that nigger parade because that will be our leverage with the other whites. Now, let me go. Let's put the year 1915 on the top of my forehead. Pre-1915, there is no record of Jewish philanthropy in the black community. 1915. Now, you remember that the Urban League and NAACP was 1908, 1909, and all the rest of that. You remember that? All right. Wait, I just want to this way. So, but these were predominantly being assisted by Angolos. <clears throat> and that the Angolos were, in fact, the ones that they all sought to be with, the Jewish philanthropists as well as the talented Tim. In fact, it mentions that there emerged an alliance. This is where you got to go back to the black. This will come out in the black and Jews thing. We'll go into this a little deeper. 
but that this so-called alliance that we've had started with Jewish wealthy and college educated blacks. That was the alliance. Now that's significant, it, just to rehash it. What is significant about Jewish wealthy setting up an alliance with the best of the blacks which were only college educated blacks? In other words, the so-called alliance never started equally because there were no black wealthy to ally with Jewish wealthy to make it a mutual alliance. Never from the beginning. So that the blacks who were gathered up to be the alliance partners to the Jewish wealthy were in fact college educated blacks or as they say here, a talented tenth blacks. Which meant that all the blacks had for power was the concept of a group of blacks who would get authority over the other 90%. That was Du Bois's concept of a leadership, the talented tenth. And that that concept of leadership is what he offered to the white man to have the white man assist them in being that leadership. That the talented tenth was not a statement of guarantee with our people. Our people didn't conceive of the concept. It wasn't taken to us for ratification. It was a separating of the community in an organized decision by a weak element that felt itself intellectually superior. But in fact was not more relevant, more helpful, what was not identifiably any better than anyone else who could have been the leadership, so-called. Now, let me hook it in with you right here. I want to bring something together right on top of this that'll make it uh, real interesting. It says here, the uh, article is David Levering Lewis Parallels and Divergencies Assimilation Strategies of Afro-American and Jewish Elites from 1910 to 1930. Now, as I said, I have never been one for Negro history. But now the 1910 to 1930 period is important to us in our investigation because the spy story has told us that something happened in 1917, only 13 years after the formulation of the Boule, a predominant assignment had developed, and that that assignment gave the impression that maybe, uh, maybe, uh, uh, this was uh, set up to be the spy system. The argument simply stated that there is a time when a small number of socially powerful and politically privileged Jews and African Americans embraced the ideology of extreme cultural assimilationism. That although this ideology was empathetically, not without paradox or illogic, its ultimate consequence entailed the abandonment of identity, and that these two elites, one wealthy and pri primarily German Jewish, the other largely northern and college trained African American, reacted to threats to their hegemony from both within and from outside their ethnic universe, uh, universes, decided to concert many of their undertakings in the belief that group assimilation could accelerate through strategies of overt and covert assistance through overt and covert assistance. Influential Jews and talented 10th African Americans feared within a short span of time they would be powerless to promote their social and political programs because of nativism. Other members of their groups who were acting ignorant or less civilized. In other words, assimilation would be messed up by someone who didn't know how to eat right and speak right, white, and it says racism set off among old stock Americans by uncontrolled migration from Eastern Europe and the Deep South. Many poor whites coming from Eastern Europe, many so-called poor blacks coming from up South. Triggering in turn divisive and strident cultural and political nationalisms among the unabsorbed, increasingly despised newcomers. Now, it also contained documents of different people uh, speaking against migration, uh, which was interesting because uh, the Urban League and many others 
got in the forefront of calling for blacks to stay in the South. Uh, and that raised a lot of other uh, adjoining questions. What the familiar details of the beginnings of anti American anti-Semitism do not adequately explain is why Jewish involvement with African Americans greatly intensified after 1915, taking on an urgency of a special mission. Why Jews of influence and wealth rapidly moved from racial altruism, altruism barely distinguishable from that of a neo-abolitionist and parlor socialist wasp to virtual management of African American organizations. Virtual management of. What debate there was. It says available literature is silent about pre-1915 debate. What literature there was was abruptly resolved by August 17, 1915 lynching of Leo Frank of Marriott, Georgia. Frank was a Cornell University graduate whose grandfather had been a decorated Confederate officer and leading Atlanta businessmen. Leo Frank was head of the anti, excuse me, head of B'nai Brif in Atlanta. Leo Frank was head of B'nai Brif in Atlanta. And of course, Leo Frank was the first white man in the history of America to be solely convicted on the testimony of a black man. Now that so scared the Jewish people, so scared the Jewish people, because the Jewish people, Jewish philanthropists, old line Jewish philanthropists said, we should not get caught helping the Negro for it is not good to help America's pariah, for we too will be looked at as the pariah's assistant. And since we're trying to escape being the pariah of Europe, we won't get caught helping the Negro yet. That was the pre-1915. But when the head of the International Order of B'nai B'rith in Atlanta gets hung for raping a white woman solely on the testimony of a black man, they got scared of this shit. That scared them. That's when they ran out and formed the Anti-Defamation League. Because that's when they knew that if a black man could convict a Jewish man, white man in America, that they better get out quick and get some sort of organization to protect them. Because to them it couldn't have been anything lower. It says here, listen to this. It says that... Um, Accused of the murder-rape of a white female, he was the first white man in post-bellum South to be convicted on the capital offense on the testimony of an African-American. The incendiary speeches of Tom Watson, the nearly demented Georgia populist leader, and the barbarianism of Marietta Mob made it clear that the victim's punishment had been determined by race and class rather than by regard for evidence. The Frank Clay's case also briefly threatened Afro-American Jewish goodwill when the Jewish-owned New York Times demanded that the Georgia authorities try the African-American janitor, the sole witness to the crime, as the guilty party. Yeah, yeah. Meaning, hey, not only is he not guilty, but try the nigga. You know what you're supposed to do. It's a nigga against all of us. It says there were many use of distinctions. It says that the Jewish leaders preferred leaders of accommodation rather than of protest. What's wrong? Something wrong? Oh, yes, please. Oh, yeah. Now, Sister is going to start in the back of the room and start passing the hat while I'm talking so that I can keep talking. Uh, I want you to do, do good. Uh, again, I tell you, outside of two or three people, we've been getting about $1.60 a person. And I think we just deserve better. Uh, I don't know, one day, sister, we may have to go to $5 admission at the door uh, to get the money. Because uh, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to say it. I, I don't, you know. I used to count the money here and tell you what was there and beg you some more. I just been going home, and uh, sometimes when I get home, and I can barely speak, my throat is swollen. I got to look in the pile and start rearranging for the next lecture. 
and look in there and see $140, $150, uh, spending two, three, four days trying to put this together, it can be a little disheartening. A sizable, thick. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody had taken put a blown up dollar bill in there, right? <laughs> and there shouldn't be anybody that does nothing. That just shouldn't be. Now, let me go ahead on. I'm a, I'm trying to do my best. I'm telling you, every day I leave here, sister will tell you, I'll be up till 4 or 5 o'clock this morning trying to finish reading. There is so much to catch up with in this new area that I just don't have enough time to do it all. And, oh, you'll be okay, Poochie Bear. Hey, my aunt. Oh, my aunt. Hey, my aunt. Hi, baby. Hi, baby. Now, every other guy in here, my aunt, would jump in Lisa's arms in a minute. <laughs> well, say, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, listen up. Let's try this here. Now, listen to this. Now, when the Jewish people start to get involved, having uh, been afraid by what happened, when the Jewish people start getting involved, um, they talk about that they start looking for blacks in the various cities that had pedigree. The word pedigree was used. Now, in the article condemning me uh, by uh, 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 this guy Taylor Branch in here, in, in condemning me, he said, Coakley lacked pedigree. Therefore, he was like a, a scavenger fish type of thing. <laughs> but, but in looking at our community, he used the word pedigree. Sister, you come all the way out? You got to, got to come all the way out. we go. There we go. Uh, now, you can't be hungry and be missing nobody now. <laughs> Telling me, baby, you know what we need. And I say, baby, I seen you when you miss a whole row of them people. <laughs> Brother Ed, you been making around with the raffle? Okay, as soon as we've been with the donation, Ed gonna go around with the raffle where we gonna uh, raffle off that tape. And you can't lose by putting up a dollar or two or five because everybody got a chance to win. And, and you never know, I tell you that you'll really love that video when it just costs a dollar. And she'd be spinning you said, look at that video. I don't even care what it say, it's just a dollar. Even if I tape over it, I couldn't have bought it for a dollar. <laughs> so it might just be a three dollar bonus for you. <laughs> but hey, whatever's to you, uh, but it's there. Now, it says here that during the ascendancy of Booker T. Washington, militant Afro-American spokesmen in the North had commanded little of the loyalty of the masses of their own people, nor the attention of white philanthropy to say nothing of the heed of the politicians. The death of the great accommodator in November of 1915 opened a crisis in race leadership. In that, in that already became apparent that the Bookerite philosophy of African American development through subordinate agriculture and trades was far more suited for the rural South. By 1917, perhaps as many as 250,000 Southern African Americans were resettled in urban north and east. And Bookerites had a few answers to socioeconomic crisis raised by the Great Migration. Consequently, many of the great industrial philanthropists turned from Tuskegee and Hampton Institute's political cadres to the urban, mostly northern men and women who had never forewarn faith in full civil and social equity and for whom the NAACP's Du Bois, Boston's William Monroe Trotter, Washington's Francis Grimke and Kelly Miller and Chicago's Ida B. Wells Barnett were heroes. Those were the radically racial men and women with whom socially constructive conservative Jewish elite would form an alliance. Many of the talented 10th were stamped in what E. Franklin Frazier called the genteel tradition of the small group of mulattoes who assimilated the morals and manners of slaveholding aristocracy. But the nucleus was free black, descended from tiny colonial population, uh, populations concentrated in Boston, Brooklyn, and Philadelphia, the founding place of the Boule, and Providence, Rhode Island, gradually augmented by underground railroad fugitives 
and after the Civil War by Southerners with some or all of the endowments of pedigree, professional distinction, good morals, and affordable racial mixture that is derived from antebellum liaisons. A few names, Fortin, Herodin, Purvis, Spyhax, Trotter, Whipper, Downey represented the moderate fortunes from real estate insurance, publishing, medicine, hosteling, and construction. But most were from the generations of solid middle class incomes. The talented 10th was exemplified by the National Urban League leadership of the early 20s. Eugene Kinkle Jones and George Edmund Hayes, opportunity editor Charles S. Johnson, Chicago Urban League director T. Arnold Hill, all of whom were sons of professional fathers, second generation college products. Second generation. So you only had one group of college educated men. When the boule starts off, you actually got the second generation of college educated men. So on your second turn, the white man guarantees that crowd, crowd one and crowd two, perpetual leadership. Because in here it says that if you agreed to be a part of this, you could at least have leadership for 40 years. Why they picked 40, I don't know. Interestingly enough, it makes a comment about that when the Jewish people joined philanthropy, it allowed them to do something for other whites. It says, the Jewish civil rights role relieved the DuPonts, the Fords, the Mellons, the Rockefellers, and other genteel capitalists from the burden of more infrequent ceremonial contact with African-American leaders and organizations, which in turn somewhat vaguely obligated those capitalists to closer ties with Jewish financiers and philanthropists. See what I'm saying? That because the Jewish people showed up and relieved the DuPonts, the Astors, the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Fords, etc., from spending their time or wasting their time giving their money away to Negroes in hump and pop ceremony. That the Jewish community came in and became that tender to the black leadership which obligated the Carnegie's, Mellon's, DuPont's and others to fraternize with Jewish philanthropy for assisting them on the Negro question. So that when they tell you we've been a partner in the Black Jewish Alliance, you tell them, my knowledge is that the richest of you circumvented the riches of the Anglo whites who you sought to get with at the museum and the Art Institute and the Symphony Orchestra and the Opera, of which you had not been allowed to be on yet. That by giving philanthropy to the Negro who you never hung with, you in fact tended to an obligation that the white race had to keep niggas cool. And that for that, for example, Japan and Germany want to come in on the world thing. So every time something come up, America say, well, Japan, you got to put money up for Russia. Japan, Germany, you got to put some money up for Russia. You all got to help pay what it cost us to pay the world off. We'll put you on the Security Council of the UN. We'll put you, but you got to fork up and pay over for the containment of the globe. So in other words, if you're going to Japan enjoy the benefits of a world we dominate with military strength and violence, you got to pay us for dominating it. And so, and so for the Jewish philanthropists to be included in the Anglophiles, which was what both groups aspired, the blacks and the Jewish people aspired to be up there, they had to show that they would foot the bill. You with me? <laughs> so when they go into that dialogue about, and boy, I, I couldn't imagine them ever showing up for a real meeting over history. But God, we could, we could have a trial. We could try black Jewish relations. And see what happened in there. Now, listen to this. In fact, uh, the guy Villard said, I have never appealed to them for aid to the Negro and been rebuffed. Villard Villard was the first uh, Anglo or white, he was the first chairman of the NAACP of which Spingard then followed him. But Villard only stayed there until Du Bois attacked Villard and made him leave, which brought Spingard in. And you must remember that too. 
That's a preferred leadership. Now, it says here that support of and participation in African American civil rights movement was seen after 1915 as meeting Jewish needs. When barely 10 years earlier, they had supported those African American forces, the Bookerites only. It says, in the aftermath of the Frank case, upper class Jews increasingly encouraged the new African American leadership, the talented 10th, which employed agitation and publicity as principal weapons to force the glacial pace of civil rights. By establishing a presence at the center of the civil rights movement with intelligence, money, and influence, elite Jews and their delegates could fight against anti-Semitism by remote control. You see, when Coakley gets attacked, I'll show you all the stories. They say, where are our responsible black leaders? Meaning, where are the ones that we paid to attack in a situation like this? You know what I mean? And, and so in other words, they're going to a fight the attack on themselves by remote control. In other words, if LeGrand Clegg says that Jewish people have dominated the influence of Hollywood and have portrayed negative images, and then by noon, Ben Hooks condemns him, the man who he was speaking for. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to fight LeGrand's so-called anti-Semitism because by remote control, they could clock the niggas to do it. That's right. That was the point. <clears throat> to be able to clock you a nigga to show up. <laughs> That's why they put niggas in the forefront of all their fights. That's right. So they put a sister was head and Planned Parenthood and they know how to do that. Mary Wright Edelman, she's theirs too. Eleanor, Eleanor Holmes Norton, she's theirs too. Wow. Mm. Listen to this. This is deep. Julius Rosenwald became a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation in 1922. This is very important because the Rosenwald Fund had always given out a lot of money to black schools. In fact, by the time Rosenwald hooks up with Rockefeller in the 20s, he had already given away $4 million to secondary and primary schools in the South. In the South. Now, what was important about Rosenwald coming on the board of the Rockefeller Foundation was that it meant that they would unify their philanthropic efforts. That was important because you couldn't have one group of whites building up the wrong set of niggas. <laughs> so you had to have a clearinghouse so that you could check with your army man to find out who the troublemakers were mm -hmm. because you never give money to a troublemaker. The word in their bill is don't feed the teachers. So remember that phrase. That's the, that hangs up, up in them foundations. It said right on the wall. Don't feed the teachers. Yeah. And then the sub line is feed the dumb and the ambitious. Mm -hmm. right. Now, Julius Rosenwald became a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation in 22. After distributing more than four million or less out of his pocket to build schools for Southern blacks. Now remember that book. I mentioned to you the book by Carter G. Woodson. And uh, where that? There you go, show you right. I mentioned this book here because this is the book that will show you exactly everywhere that Rosa Wall put that money, everywhere the Pew Foundation put their money, everywhere the Rockefellers put their money. It's in a chapter called Educational Development. And in that chapter, it just lays out tons. It says the education of the Negro, however, has continued in the hands of whites and the Negroes themselves being largely the objects of such efforts. This results from the fact that in the main it is a concern of the government and Negroes are not permitted to figure conspicuously in this sphere. The philanthropists are not to be blamed for this. They are merely dealing with the situation as they found it. The public functioning functioners believe that it ensures 
to their special program to direct the mental development of the Negro along the lines which is not prejudicial to their interest. To develop the Negro along the lines which is not prejudicial to their interest. And some of them, discarding the economic principle that the consumer pays the tax, boldly assert that since they are financing the education of the Negro, they have the right to direct it as they will. The education of the Negro, therefore, has been largely a process of telling the Negro what someone else wants him to say or do and watching him do it in automatic fashion. Mm. Clear as day, the Negro in our history called the educational development. Page 572. Carter G. Woodson and Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley, of course, course wrote the history book of the Boulay. Carter G. Woodson wrote The Miseducation of the Negro. Mm -hmm. And the Education of the Negro. Correct. Outstandingly correct. The General Education Board. Anytime you're researching the, the past, you see the word General Education Board. That was the forerunner to the Rockefeller Foundation. That was his name before it became called Rockefeller Foundation. It was Rockefeller's foundation, the General Education Fund. It's just that it become, it was just that, an education fund. It says the General Education Fund in dealing with the problem of Negro education in the South has consistently tried to aid the various education agencies of the states in their endeavors. In 1910, the Peapody Education Fund, the Southern Education Board, enabled Virginia to employ a state grant for Negro rural schools. The following year, the General Education Board took over the support of this work and extended the offer to other southern states, Kentucky, Alabama, Arkansas responded at once and they were closely followed by North Carolina and Tennessee. By 1914, Georgia was added. By 1919, each of the southern states had an appointed state agent for Negro rural schools as a member of the staff of the State Department of Edu Education paid for by the Rockefeller family. Mm. So he had built him a Negro superintendent of Negro school development in every uh. state. Uh, uh, now, if you have someone compiling a list of troublemakers, it doesn't make any difference unless you got access to controlling where a troublemaker may reside. Like at compulsory school, where everybody's forced to go. Now, if you got this sophistication of a system going, you could in fact start steering the student. Opening up positive veins or breaking down negative veins depending upon whether you want them to succeed or fail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, this book goes on, shows Howard Fisk, shows all the schools, Atlanta U, all the money. That whole thing was built by the white man. I mean, he built it to the bone. It is not that he just controlled all them historically black colleges, but he has controlled the high schools, the grammar schools, and the kindergartens, everything. He, he set it all up. He left none of it for none. Remember, it was from slavery to controlled education. Uh -huh. In other words, you were in fact just opening the cow out of a barn and sending them in to a barn house. He never really ever got a chance to roam free. Mm. There was never a Negro school just for Negroes, by Negroes, Negro finance. There has never, ever been one, ever. <laughs> ever. Though they bear, though they bore our name and perception, we have never, ever had one. And uh, this, this whole chapter on education, I'll just leave that up there. It talked about, just to show you the domination, I was talking to you about the Rosa Wall. It says that the Rosa Wall Fund, working in cooperation with these agencies, contributed towards the erection of 5,357 public school buildings in 15 southern states, 4,977 schoolhouses, 217 teachers' homes, 163 shops of vocational units, costing $28,408,520. This amount, of this amount, according to the report, the Negroes themselves gave $4 million in cash, labor, and materials. 
says the teacher capacity of the so-called Rosenwald schools was 14,747. And out of those teachers that the whites were grooming to teach the Negroes came the leaders of the Negroes. They were all teachers first. Mm -hmm. Many of your key black leaders now are still teaching. They have always been college incubated. Think about it. Check, 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 check. Oh, tape check. Okay, anyway, I won't go any more to that chapter, but that chapter stands alone uh, as being able to describe. What we're now talking about is that the select attack on black leadership has actually really been an attack on everybody who wasn't on the program. If Copley lacked pedigree and was a uh, street scavenger, peddling tapes, then that was because he knew everybody else in the scheme was on the program. <laughs> there wasn't nobody in the program that wasn't on the program. And little bit notes to the ones who rise up to get to the door to find out that by pedigree, breeding, mm -hmm. assimilation, ambition, and other uh, unworthy characteristics that your talent, your skill, your desire, and your ability to be effective for the race, which is why you can understand why they wanted to ridicule Marcus Garvey. They just didn't say, we don't want Marcus Garvey, but they call him black and dumb and ugly. What was that Du Bois call him? Big lips. Big lips and what else? Like a Marcus Garvey called him a monstrosity. Now what? Marcus Garvey called him a monstrosity. A monstrosity. In fact, talks about the day Marcus Garvey went to the NAACP offices and saw all them white people running everything and stormed out of there saying, I don't believe it. <laughs> and, that, and that was interesting because he could not believe that they would accept this relationship from the white man. When in fact, if they had just stuck with him, they could have had it all. Do you understand that if they hadn't broke ranks, and decided to bite on to the hope of the American dream, we could have had it. Uh -huh. And that it wasn't the attack of the white man that stopped us from getting it. It was the allowance of a group of blacks to stop from supporting it. That, that's what it was. That's what it was. And that's right. That brings us to 1993. What was in it? Huh? So that, we have to give some, uh, some credit to that. Now listen to this. Listen up. The Rosenwald became a trustee of the Rockefeller Foundation after dispersing more than $4 million to build, southern schools, uh, build schools for Southern blacks. That's why I jumped over to the other book to show you that they will specifically tell you how many schools, how many blacks. And that's to give them honor, not to bust them down. It says here that six years later, the reorganized Rosenwald Fund, patterned on the Rockefeller Foundation, let me repeat that. Six years later, the reorganized Rosenwald Fund, patterned on the Rockefeller Foundation, was launched to upgrade higher education in the South. Now they're moving up. Particularly for African Americans. Between 1928 and 1948, now we're in the third generation of college educated. The Rosenwald Fund allocated monies towards the endowment and construction to the major private African-American institutions of higher learning. One million thirty-seven thousand to Dill Dillard, six hundred sixty-eight thousand to Fisk, five hundred forty-two thousand to Atlanta U. Most of these granted in the early years of the Rosenwald Fund's existence. Fellowships to artists. Listen to this. This is deep. Part of that money that went into those black schools at Fisk and the other places came after there were boycotts on those campuses by the students saying that the curriculum, which was white dominated, the teachers, which were white dominated, and the presidents, which were white, said that the education at those black schools were demeaning them. So Du Bois helped lead some of the protests at Fisk and other places against the curriculum. 
And that then compelled the philanthropist to shift the money flow from entry education till we better co-op the top black education. And all of a sudden, all this six, seven, eight hundred thousands start flooding in in the 20s to these black schools to compromise the fact that they're starting to be a hotbed of dissent. So now, start some shit in the spot and the money will follow. Listen to this. Listen to this. They say, we not only brought on those black college presidents, fellowships to artists, educators, scholars, advanced their careers of African Americans' most gifted and enterprising future college presidents, such as Charles Johnson of Fisk, Mordecai Johnson of Howard, Horace Mann Bond of Lincoln U., Dwight O.W. Holmes of Morgan State, humanist, social scientists such as Adeline Cromwell Hill. Anybody ever heard of her? Kenneth Clark. Allison Davis. Uh, 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 Sinclair Drake. Ira D. R. A. Reed. Abram Harris. Lorenzo Turner. And artists and writers such as James Weldon Johnson. The first Rosenwald Grantee, Sterling Brown, Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, Arna Von Timps, Richmond Bothy, <laughs> Jack, Jack, Selma Burke, Augusta Savage, Hale Woodruff, Jacob Lawrence. Significantly, Jewish educational philanthropy accelerated shortly after Fisk Howard Hampton had student protests in the 20s against policies and curriculum that a new generation of students considered racially demeaning. A crucial, if not apparent, difference between Jewish and WASH benefaction of African American higher education was the assistance of the former on education of competitive quality. The earnest similar commitment of WASP philanthropy had become increasingly compromised after the turn of the century because southern white pressures to supplant liberal arts and white collar professional training with vocational instruction reinforced by ethnic and sub subservient separateness. What they were saying is that the old line Anglos, Rockefellers, DuPonts, and etc., who were industrialists, sought to finance vocational education because they were industrialists. Whereas when the Jewish boys came, they put them in the humanities, in the arts, poetry, etc. Because why? Remember we talked the other night that in attacking Marcus Garvey, the Harlem Renaissance was a covert action project to build up Negro, not in politics, not in liberation, but in arts, humanities, and music. As, as agreeable outlets for Negro creativity. Much more acceptable than back to Africa movements. With me? Yeah. Now, it's coming together. Damn. All these Negroes been studying Negro history, what did they find? I'm wondering what they was looking at. Because now that we didn't look at it, shit. And I'm using this book, but I could take you 10 books and collaborate everything I'm saying in this book. Mm -hmm. And this book got good, good, good footnotes in it to get you 10 books on every single thing that it says. And I can find 10 they didn't mention, which means the themes are readily findable. But weaving them and spitting them back in the now, a wall. Don't have. Don't have. It says that, mm, very key, okay. Constructive charity, profound influence, contribution to the formation of a kindred elite, followed quietly from the policies of Jewish leadership. The contribution to the formation of a kindred elite. Let me read, read that again. Huh, boy. 
constructive charity, profound influence, and contribution to the formation of a kindred elite followed, fl flowed quietly from the policies of Jewish leadership. An additional benefit deriving from African American philanthropy, or so Alfred Stern, Jewish Rosenwald's son-in-law, hoped was the undermining of the stereotype of Jews as pre predatory merchants and exploiters of real estate. In other words, the giving of money by Jewish people to the Negro was to offset the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And the international Jew, which called the Jewish man a money-grabbing hunky dogma. Of which he was. And is. Is. In the greater sense. Sense. What he was. He is that and more. The beast. In fact, don't forget, this is a beast feeding session. That's wrong. That's wrong, Italy. Who feeds the beast? The dog. The beast. The beast. Now, it says here. Yeah, that's deep. For the talented 10th, heightened Jewish collaboration was extremely beneficial, for it too was caught in, and unprepared by what the novelist and poet Claude McKay called African Zionism of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. The Garvey's movement's leadership uh, was the majority, majority was of true believers, but its growing appeal among African Americans extended from coast to coast, deep into the South. Charisma and pageantry, pageant, pageantry, exotic titles, uniform cadres, and the daunting cry of Africa for Africans, and a strident doctrine of unique racially purified destiny of Mother Africa expounded upon the American scene after 1917. With it, stress on separate development and entrepreneurship and self-help. UNIA ideology appealed to thousands who felt the void created by Booker T. Washington's death. And Garvey, and Garvey, of course, professed to be a modernizing, internationalizing, internationalizing disciple of Booker T. Although there were several significant defections to Garveyism, the overwhelming majority of talented 10th leadership was stunned, defensive, and resentful. Even Du Bois would claim to be the originator of Pan-Africanism in the United States, recoiled from Garveyism after a brief, brief period of probing uncertainty. From the perspective of the talented 10th, then, the more Garvey succeeded, the greater the dangers of racial polarization and finally repression. I remember there was a point in Chicago when the Steve Coakley thing had come down, and what had happened was there was a reprioritization of focus. And people were saying, well, let's get with Coakley. Let's, uh, let's, let's rechange how we attack in this thing. Let's, let's get behind Steve because if the mayor agrees not to fire him and we stick with him and he's clean, then this represents the one we can back up all the way. And then another guy stands up, a prominent black attorney, former U.S. attorney, steps up in the room and says, as fact, it's Tom Todd. He says, I won't accept no leadership from no hooligan like Coakley. And then the others in the room began to say, well, what are you saying? He said, if you get with him, all y'all going to lose your money. Point being was that if you all go for this new leadership thing, then the money ain't going to flow. And you know as long as you keep doing what you're supposed to, the money going to keep flowing. Yeah. Now, you get with Coakley, you better be ready to starve. Right. Now, now, if you put it to a question of, would you fast for freedom? <laughs> the majority of people say yes. But they didn't ask the people the question. The ones who were fat belly made the decision for the ones who were hungry. And we're still making fat belly decisions. You see, again, the, if the righteous leadership develops that's hungry, the elite will not 
follow them. Because there is nothing short of a white man's fart <laughs> shall they follow. Come on with that. <laughs> so you're right. <laughs> USA. Oh. <laughs> there you check. All right. Says here, says that American Negro leaders are not jealous of Garvey, the crisis protested. They are not envious of success. They're simply afraid of his failure, for his failure will be theirs. But despite Du Bois's disclaimer, the talented tenth was envious and afraid of having to share and perhaps even yield its pretensions to leadership of the African American masses. Garvey was only partly blustering when he charged, quote, that the Negro who has the benefit of an education 40, 30, or 20 years ago is the greatest fraud and stumbling block to the real progress of the race. And you know what? And you know what? Garvey was only partly blustering when he charged, quote, the Negro who has had the benefit of an education of 40, 30, and 20 years ago is the greatest fraud and stumbling block to the real progress of the race. Nor, it says, nor was he guilty, as some pretended to believe, of applying an inappropriate West Indian color status theorem to African American leadership in the United States. If it was vicious to call attention publicly to the light complexions of the talented 10th, it was also extremely effective against Du Bois, Jesse Moreland of the Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, uh -huh. uh, Walter White, and their kind. Uh -huh. That charge drew from Du Bois the immediate warning, quote, American Negroes recognize no color line in and out of the race, and they will in the end punish the man who attempts to establish it. Oh. You hear that? Oh, yeah. You understand what he's saying? We will punish any man that reduces this to black and white. And, right, and that became the punishment of Marcus Garvey. For it was just that clear to him. The deflation of, and this, we read this the other night, I'm just going to read it again to put it in context. Uh, just as uptown Jews tried to outflank the Zionists by combining with lower east side socialists, upper crust African Americans readily joined with Harlem socialists who are still there today in Harlem, socialists acting, some of their left counterparts are here in Los Angeles, still lefting. <laughs> it's the left or the right side of the white groin. <laughs> no applause necessary. It says, just as Uptown Jubilee, the African-American upper crust readily joined with the Harlem Socialists, led by the African Blood Brotherhood's Cyril Briggs to defeat the Garveyites. What's anybody know about the African Blood Brotherhoods? Anybody know anything about that? That's something we got to check out. I got to ask. I'm assuming everybody know what it is. I don't know what it is. Or well, who was Cyril Briggs? Yeah, you know they do. But I skipped all that early part. I went all the way to the back part. Um, the deflation of Garveyism presented the talented 10th leaders with an acute credibility crisis. For now they had to prove that Garvey's extreme pes pessimism about the future of the race in the United States was unjustified and that by helping to scuttle the fervent mass movement, they had not co-signed 11 million African Americans to perpetual economic and social misery, which they did. But the evidence and trends supported the Garveyite predictions. They have found that the blacks in uh, industry had declined during the 20s. Quote, numbers of them had gone back into domestic and personal service, while the Negro women who had given up outside employment had been forced to return to work. The talented 10th anxieties about the dilemma permeated the writings of Elaine Locke, America's first black road scholar, knew what a close call Garveyism, Garveyism had represented. Quote, we have for the present, in spite of Garvey's heroic efforts, no Zionistic hope or intention. What the opportunity called, quote, dumb dark masses were urgently in need of a new opiate. For Locke well understood that Garveyism has shown, quote, how much more ready and right for action than the minds of the leaders and the educated few the masses were. 
So they knew already that they were not in the forefront of the aspirations of their people. But they were never willing to concede to their people's aspirations, the ones they claim to represent. A leader is a so-called consensus of his own followers' aspirations, not in separate or indifferent to those who they claim to serve. And that's a fundamental fuck up. Says the only safeguard for mass relations in the future must be provided and carefully maintained contacts of the enlightened minorities of both races. Says, but we have to be careful about those who call for their ounce of democracy today, least tomorrow they are beyond cure. Hence the race leaders, hence the race leaders must be clearly seen to have influence among the movers and shakers in the white world. A role legitimating requirement that despite Garvey's example, might all found to be fundamental race feature. The interracial undertaking as dazzling and mounted and as publicized as those of the UNIA were called for. Promotion and celebration of symbolic racial breakthroughs were indispensable. What they're saying here is that the race leaders must be shown to have influence with the whites and that this is a legitimizing process. You must legitimize the leader's role in the white world. And two, that we must play up our successes to counteract the pageantry, the parading, the uniforming, and the giving away of authority by Garvey. If Garvey said, you are the lieutenant general of the UNIA in Chicago, a nigga had authority. There was nothing that he could get where he could have a position in. Because having come out of slavery, they beat organization down. So there was no spot where you could get qualities. So Garvey was making qualities. Giving people assignments, uniforms, bars, stripes, commissions as generals. And they said, look out. So we have to do the same in reverse. We've got to play up our own Negroes things and play them up high so that they would have the same perceptions uh, and that these were role legitimizing requirements the first and most obvious was the redoubling of advocacy of civil rights before the courts and congress the second was the novel strategy of harnessing art and literature replacing civil rights in other words to ventilate in the courts and Congress, make the Negro member, the NAACP comes in, and the black scr struggle becomes the court struggle. We're going to the court to get the court to give us the right. That that was a deviation from direct rights. I'll beat him, therefore I'll have rights from him. And, and then it says that they then off, also went off into art and literature, replacing civil rights. So that 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 that, that was the pursuit. By the end of the 1920s, the talented Tim spoke warmly of the special relationship with Jews. James Weldon Johnson and White routinely scrutinized obituary columns for Jewish legacies that the NAACP might tap and listed prospective contributors, a disproportionate number of whom were Jews. During the Depression, William Rosenwald made a three-year grant to the NAACP on the condition of it being matched by three others, Lerman, Mary Fells, and Felix Warbug, who is the brother of Paul Warbug, who set up the Federal Reserve Bank at Jekyll Island with Rockefeller, and also what financiers of Hitler. Mm. The Warbugs, they was hooked right in there. Also in the founding group of the Council on Foreign Relations. So what we're looking at, remember Du Bois was the first black man to speak at the Council on Foreign Relations. So we're looking at Oh, yeah, I better just read this into the record before I forget. We're looking at them uh, 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 showing that the top whites were directly connecting to these blacks that we're looking at. It says here, uh, the Times of Tips primarily answer to black Zionism was the literary and artistic industry that manufactured the so-called Harlem Renaissance. The have dozen or so African-American orchestrators of the Harlem Renaissance, Charles Johnson, James Weldon Johnson, Walter White, Fawcett, Elaine Locke, and West Indian uh, 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 Arthur Schomburg, a bibliophile, uh, Arthur Schomburg, who has a Schomburg Museum in New York. We got to get in there because a lot of that Negro stuff is in that Schomburg Museum. 
uh, and uh, the West Indian Numbers King Casper Holstein Stein, conceived of it as a serious racial politic, art for politics sake, or civil rights by copyright. Students of American culture have seen the Harlem Renaissance uh, as another predictable, creatable bubble in a melting pot, a savory ingredient in a New England Knickerbocker, Hoosier, and Yiddish concoction. The Negro writers were caught up in a spirit of artistic yearnings of the time. This was true of the writer Langston Hughes and Gene Tomer, who were not typical of most of the other artists and writers. Nothing could have been seen to the most educated African Americans more impractical as a means of improving racial standings in the 20s than writing poetry and novels, painting, art, and literature were artificially created through glamorous ceremonies at the NAACP and the Urban League who sponsored huge banquets and galas, gave prizes and fellowships, Guggenheim and Rosenwald grants, Spingard medals, literary prizes funded by Holstein, traveling art shows and well-advertised fiction and poetry published by the Harmon Foundation, and Bonnie Livingright and Alfred Knopf, K-N-O-P-F, the National Recruitment of Talent by Fawcett and Charles Johnson, says that they had a list of every emerging Negro in art, talent, music, and everywhere they found them all over the country, they came to them with an offer of money and brought them into New York and made them part of this cadre of artists that they were building to make money off of. It says that uh, uh, overly mobile African Americans were at least a generation away from special cultural alienation. The insider as outsider syndrome, of which the contemporary lost generation was well publicized example. But with the decisive infusion of white philanthropy, much of it Jewish, the entrepreneurs of the Harlem Renaissance were able to mount a generation skipping movement, diverting to its ranks men and women who in their natural course of events would have devoted their extensive energies to teaching, lawyering, doctoring, fixing teeth, and bearing. Instead, they became artists, pulled out of medical school, pulled out of law school, and led into the arts versus the sciences, for which we've been accused of avoiding, not knowing that our financing of scientists was diminished, and art and music work, which is just what the fuck we still doing. <laughs> Check. Because, they, and, and to put all these musicians together, it takes, any one of them will tell you that all they lack when they go into the business is capital. So that capital is what the whites give them to keep them on Sony Records and this and that. Which means that there is capital available, not for a black think tank, not for a black hit team, but for buck dancing and music playing and art drawing, not that our culture is not a primary militant revolutionary activity as well, but they never finance our culture. They finance uh, uh, imitations of their culture. Uh -huh. And that became what they reinforced. It says the Negroes were the head of a Harlem Renaissance that they rented, for they didn't even own the Harlem that they were renaissancing. Well, it just broke down the fact that they knew they had the niggas boxed in, in an offshoot industry, misdirected away from... Pri so when we say we want to name the names and move on to conspiracy, we know there are no quote-unquote thousands of conspiracy experts because no one outside our community has ever reinforced conspiracy activity and no one within the community can acknowledge it for fear of having outside retribution. That's right. So it becomes an industry of no profile. How much are we getting that hat, sister, today? $213. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wonder who gonna want to be a militant after that? <laughs> and I know we got to cut down too. We getting we getting down on time. Uh, anyway, it says about the early thirties, the influence of whites 
uh, in the circles, Elaine Locke, the Harmon Foundation, James Weldon Johnson, the trustee of Garland and Rosewall Funds, and Charles Johnson, the all-purpose advisor, all advisor to foundations, have made the Harlem Renaissance a well oiled machine, turning out 26 novels, 10 volumes of poetry, 5 Broadway plays, innumerable essays and short stories, 2 or 3 performed ballets, concerti, and large amount of painting and sculpture. We must admit our debt to these foster agencies, Elaine Locke wrote, in acknowledgement in the crisis, opportunity, and the messenger. The three journals, which have been the vehicles of most of the uh, artistic expression uh, uh, of those financed by the whites. Hmm. Interestingly enough, the Harlem Renaissance literally took place in rented space in a Harlem they did not own. And last thing to say about this part here, as it says, the, the privileged Ashkenazim reached the African-American leadership and even helped create it, hoping, as Lewis Marshall remarked in 1924, that the success of African-American civil rights organizations may uh, benefit the Jews. Determined, it says, uh, at, at least in the short term, the collaboration was beneficial for the African-Americans. Their leadership positions were secured and would remain so for 40 years. The Harlem Renaissance bubble would soon go flat, but the basic assimilationist values and goals of the talented 10th would be perpetrated in the civil rights strategies in which the emphasis remained on court cases, contracts, contacts, and culture. For the Jews, the collaboration was extremely beneficial. By assisting in the crusade to prove that African Americans could become conformist, cultured human beings, the civil rights Jews were, in a sense, spared some of the necessity of directly rebutting anti-Semitic stereotypes. For if blacks could make good citizens, clearly most whites believed Americans, uh, most white Americans believed all other groups could make even better ones. So as if you could train a nigger, you can train them all. That's right. And that's what, in essence, they were saying there to the fosterize... Um, to fosterize their dialogue about uh, this. Now, when I was in Chicago, yes, uh, that's a series of uh, that's a series of authors in a book called Boundaries and Bridges. It's a museum exhibit. Uh, that one, uh, uh, the guy that wrote that was about assimilation strategies of Jewish and African American elite by David Levering Lewis. Uh, which he wrote in the form of uh, something uh, in the back here to tell me what he wrote in the form of. In fact, he got an inst uh, 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 index here of events of black Jewish relations. It says 1988, racial tension surfaced once again in Chicago as a result of speeches attacking whites and Jews made by the mayor's aide. The aide Steve Coakley stated that Jews were involved in an international conspiracy to rule the world and that the crucifix was a symbol of white supremacy and the Jewish doctors were injecting black babies with AIDS. Mm. Taking a week to fire Coakley brought criticism upon the mayor from whites, religious groups, and moderate blacks. If you read Coin and Tell Pro, it's one of the things that says, we will, we will castigate black nationalists to the responsible black leaders, meaning that they've always looked upon that responsible cadre of black leaders as being able to count upon them. This was a huge study done by the Community Trust in Chicago uh, of the major foundations, uh, which resulted in a study uh, precipitated uh, by the so-called uh, Coakley Affair. But what I want to show you about it is this. Reverend Kenneth Smith is a Boule member in Chicago. Franklin Cole is a major white corporate leader in Chicago. They're executive committee members of the Chicago Community Trust. Every city has a community trust. Check your local community trust. They were chosen to co-chair the task force. Two other members were James Bryce, who had Arthur Anderson, and Arturo Valasquez, the top Hispanic businessman in Chicago. It says they appointed 29 distinguished citizens, representing a broad spectrum of community, uh, like uh, Barry Sullivan, chairman of First Chicago, etc., etc., etc. It says the two offenses precipitating this action by the trust, which was to put this study together. Chicago Community Trust established a task force to consider the cause of and possible solutions for ethnic and racial unrest that characterized the public life in Chicago. The 
two events precipitating this action. The first was the occasion of a black mayor's aide. Inflammatory comments about whites, especially Jews and city leaders. The other was the upcoming mayoral election in which race relations were expected to play a major role and a destructive role. In fact, while voting was largely along racial lines, the racial tension expected did not occur. Now, what did they do in regards to Coakley making comments about whites? Why is Coakley's comments about whites worth a hundred, uh, uh, fifty, uh, uh, excuse me, twenty-nine white leaders and black leaders getting together to have a study to, in its approach to meeting its obligation under the resolution which created it, the task force therefore undertook a four-pronged comprehensive what? Information gathering. Spying mm -hmm. and assessment. That's, this is intelligence gathering. Mm -hmm. This is intelligence analysis. Okay. Assessment. This plan included seven studies by recognized scholars. That means they all got paid. <laughs> in several disciplines. Ninety. 90, 90 neighborhood-based focus groups, intense, intense personal interviews with how many? 150. How many do a town have? 150 leaders. <laughs> and the task force analysis and discussions with noted civic and community leaders. The objective of this approach simply stated were to provide the member of the task force with the necessary historical perspective, to determine socioeconomic forces currently at work throughout the city, and their relationship to racial and ethnic tensions, to discover the prevailing attitudes at the neighborhood and citywide leadership levels towards racial tensions, the white man, in throughout the city, to recommend and help determine future actions that might eliminate how many leaders? 150. Why? It's 1988. It took them a year and a half to do the study. Everybody that they brought in, they asked, are you with Coakley? That's what they asked them. That's the first thing they asked all of them. And I told you, I took testimony from people who were jacked up at these focus. Now this is just what the rich white community trust did. The American Jewish Committee held a set of them. The ADL held a set of them. And all they asked every sub leader was, can I count on you if I fuck with Coakley? Mm. Now, in other words, if they say, see no evil, hear no evil, do no evil, Coakley's dead. It's just that simple. Uh. Now, all of this done against me, all of this buildup was all fostered and instigated by one Jewish rabbi mm. named Rabbi Robert Marx. Looked a lot like Karl Marx, too. <laughs> rabbi Marx and Michael Coulson yeah. and Irv Kupsonet were the primary lead men in the attack on Coakley that sought nothing less than to kill him. Mm. Don't know, and we ain't got no doubt about what they were up to. Mm. Now, time has passed. The leaders have been ventilated. They said, I can't come out publicly with you on this Coakley question because for years Coakley has been up under our shirts. I kind of like the guy, I kind of don't like the guy, but I'm not going to get caught publicly coming against him. Now, they got ten people to come out against me. I stated emphatically for the record. There are not but seven of them still alive. Mm. One of them defected. Six. 
is all we see. And the suggestion is, again, as you can see what happens, if they can get the consensus on the back side of the situation, then the, the then it's over. Now, I just want to show you something. This is the front of what they call the donors forum. When the report was finished, when the task force report was finished, it went to the donors forum. And the donors forum, well I want to show you on the board real quickly, then came out with what they came up with as a conclusion about the attack on Coakley and Coakley's role and responsibilities. Let's see here, let's see, let's see if I can move it up some. Let me see if I can blow it up some. Oh, okay, it's not gonna get uh, much clearer. Okay, let me just see if I can. And Krumah, I'm really glad you brought this. This really does help the lecture, brother. I really appreciate you. Where you at, you still here? Brother and crew, I know he's been in and out. Uh, now, uh, let me tighten that up so I can read you that little part I got underlined there. Oh, there we go. Let's see if I can read this. It says here, Furthermore, Chicago's current racially divisive environment to have the type of leadership that the situation calls for is probably too much to expect. Also, he went on, Chicago is not very honest. Race is a very real factor in this town and we say that, but then we want to downplay it, and that's not very realistic. I've heard people talk about what are the most important issues in Chicago, education, economic development, and all the rest. But I will be willing to debate any of them that the most important issue in Chicago is race. And we're not going to solve any of our other problems until we solve the racial problem. In effect, the process calls for a cadre of trained professionals like the Foreign Service, whose goals would be to ease ethnic tensions and promote a truly integrated society. <laughs> As a step towards that solution, Clarence Woods, who wrote up the report for the Community Trust, at the end of his writing up this report, he was appointed for one dollar a year as the chairman of Chicago's Commission on Human Relations. He says, Woods suggested that somebody in Chicago has to be put in charge of managing it into a friendlier town in terms of its religious, racial, and ethnic makeup and that doesn't happen no matter what else we do we aren't going to accomplish anything. Now, there's one more part to this where he makes a suggestion about what will it take. See the suggestion is why did not those leaders come out and condemn Coakley like we had paid for them to and he came out with a conclusion I just want to see if I can put it up here for you just to get in the record. I can tell you what it says because I know it by heart but I just want to see if I can show it to you he says that we looked at when we talked to the Negro leaders we found out that we were not giving them enough to come against a Coakley and so therefore, they wouldn't do it because we haven't paid for them enough to. <laughs> now, what we need to do this, while I'm looking for this, we need to pass the hat for the good life. Could somebody be willing, Sister Lisa, would you be willing to walk that uh, uh, bucket around for the good life? And that's to help them pay for the people who finished working two hours ago, who can't leave until we leave, who can pick up a few extra dollars for having had to stay. And uh, we would want that uh, because we appreciate having the opportunity to be here. And what I'm trying to show you, I have to show you the live copy now. I can't find the uh, perforated copy. But what, what it in fact said was that we are not paying people enough to come against a guy like Coakley. Therefore, unless we pay better, we for will forever be played by <laughs> what it is that they're bringing us because we're not giving up enough money to offset it. Remember I always told you 
that they don't get loyalty based upon having the right position. That their loyalty is very weak. It won't be hard beating them because we know that loyalty, here it is here, there we go. This is the live copy of the donors forum of which I'm showing you there. And it's on this page here that they make this statement. Woods also relates education in black communities to black response to Coakley's revelations. Both indicate a lack of black confidence in their respective public processes. That blacks are in a quandary and are not stepping up to the table to participate in school reform indicates a lack of confidence in the reform process. So too, the relatively turpid black response to Coakley points to the widespread sense among well-educated, successful blacks that the system is not working for them in the same way it works for their white counterparts, thus reducing their incentive to reject a man bent on attacking the same social and economic system. Yeah. Unless the allied base sees race as the more fundamental problem, broadening, broadens, and more of the city is joined to the real battle, more and more Coakley types will occur. <laughs> <laughs> so it says, thus reducing their incentive to reject a man bent on attacking the social and economic system. Bent on meaning beyond repair, bent on attacking. Everybody got their price. Everybody got their price, that's right. Uh, how are we doing on the, on the, yeah, how many? And we'll see, we'll pull this at, we'll pull the, uh, the uh, video real quick. Uh, we made $211 in the pot. It would be nice if it was $250. It would be even better if it was $300. It'd be great if you wrote a check. I love and it. a symbol of skull and bones and hook it up with their history book and put it on a flyer and put about 200 of these posted around Washington, D.C. You, in fact, will frighten the members. We, we put out about 50,000 flyers and I know that, that our strategy was that we really didn't care if they came to the lecture if they just took our flyer home because that will plant a seed that we'll harvest at a later date. And uh, we took, I took the quote this is uh, one of the most better known outside groups in Washington, African Minds United of Los Angeles. You should be proud of them. That's right. That's right. And we should have African Minds United in Washington, D.C. That's something we'll be talking about. And hooking it up with Skull and Bones and Wesley's comments from the History of Sigma Pi Phi. And you know, I mentioned the other day about AMU being targeted as a part of uh, Stirring up trouble at uh, Normandy and Florence with that. that had been put into the Sentinel by who was the writer? Ennis Shotsman. Ennis Shotsman. That's a black person? Ennis Shotsman. Ennis. Dennis. Dennis Shotsman, who wrote a story that in effect fingered African Minds United as well as UNIA. As well as the UNIA and Brother Roland. Uh, coalition Against Black Exploitation as being troublemakers. And I uh, admitted, uh, uh, mentioned in the other meeting that just that type of label will compel the intelligence community to open up a file on the organizations based upon the fact there's a brother from the Bow Group. Uh, got a little youth coming up with names that we like, like the Bow Group. Yeah. Right, right. Okay, we're winding down because we need to settle up. Uh, brother Ed? Let me get the uh, things uh, there. A raffle off, a brother, Asinu, back mom, one of you come up so that we can do this quickly too about the ADL. Brother said we can raffle off an ADL book. This is a good book about the ADL. Uh, it's done out by LaRoches. I'm not into the LaRoches at all, whatsoever, in any sort of way. I was going to say they were giving them away. That's good. And in the book, uh, it talks about how the ADL was connected to Meyer Lansky. Yeah. And that's important because you remember Meyer Lansky had the goods on Gag Hoover. Yeah. Gag Hoover. <laughs> Hoover. Which protected, which protected Meyer Lansky and them from law enforcement. That's right. And uh, I think that there's some excellent things in here. That, uh, and Brothman, the BCCI connection and other things. Our brother was down today at the first demonstration ever 
The first demonstration ever at ADL headquarters in Los Angeles was held today. I saw it on no news this afternoon. No, uh, no news whatsoever. It's strange. And a brother's going to tell us a few words. This is Brother Ostenu, uh, one of my uh, mentors, brother I look up to, <laughs> brother I study from. Brother, I want to grow up and be like uh, who will report to us briefly on what happened there. And then we're going to be polite and help the good life uh, by clearing out and uh, doing what we can do uh, to uh, be timely. Because Sister did ask me to stop and I don't want to disrespect her. All right, war, everybody. War. Um, just a few words about the ADL. Uh, there was an article that came out on May 28th, Friday, uh, New York Times op-ed, where they talk about a statement made by Erwin Sewall, who's the uh, ADL's present fact-finding director. He said in conversations in the early and mid-1980s that the chief domestic danger to American Jews was the American left, especially black leftists, backed by the Soviet Union. He argued that white-ring extremists, even those with high-level connections were insignificant by comparison, and to focus on them, he said, would be a dangerous diversion from the struggle against communism at home and abroad. Interestingly enough, this was in the mid-'80s when, you know, the Berlin Wall had come down and even Russians were giving up uh, communism, so that just, that's crazy. But anyhow, today at uh, 11 o'clock, around 11.30, we had a demonstration at, out at the ADL offices on Santa Monica. There were about 60 people uh, and what what was interesting is that the LaRouche sh showed up just as we were get, we were beginning to start, and they were the ones who were handing out copies of the truth about the ADL. There were predominantly it was predominantly white Arab, and there were you know a handful of Africans. What was interesting is that the police showed up, and there was a police photographer taking everybody's picture. But luckily, Brother Jamal, as well as Brother Maurice, were there. They went up and videotaped him taking pictures of us. So is we there any way we can see it? Any way we can see that tonight? You, you don't have the video. Oh, anyway, I know. Okay, okay. We have to. Will y'all promise to bring it so we can see their faces? Two, two. Yeah. yeah. Right. Now don't you be setting no dates. <laughs> <laughs> you already the well, cameraman. Let's do it. Be a I know them guys. <laughs> And so, uh, in terms of speakers, they had Casey Kasem speaking for the Arab American All right, group. for Casey Kasem. Let's hear it for him. I'll get a fight for him to get out. They had... Uh, everybody playing music ain't dancing. Right. <laughs> Former uh, city council person Robert Farrell spoke, as well as uh, Kenneth Carr or D. Don Kamathi from All the right, Arab Revolution. All right, let's get the and, and like I so, said, so it was a pretty good demonstration. Interestingly enough, although they put the uh, press release out to all the press to the citywide news service, the only people that showed up were KFI, and I didn't hear anything on them. Uh, the LA Times, so we need to look at the LA Times tomorrow to see if they've covered it. And uh, KPFK Pacifica sent somebody out there, and they did have a spot on their evening news. So that was the only uh, press that I heard on it. Now, I wasn't able to actually talk or hear the conversation that went on with the white photographer, so maybe Jamal or Maurice can come up and talk about that. Um, I really didn't hear it clearly because I was too busy dealing with the patient. But KJLH may report it tomorrow because I'm going to give them what we got. Okay. The sound. So, they so we should listen in the morning? I, can, I don't know. Oh, they, you don't know if they're playing. <laughs> they might do it, they might not. But Brother Maurice can kind of expand on what uh, happened with the situation with the photographer. What happened with the photographer, Brother Reese? Well, primarily, uh, go to the mic. There was a... Uh, he can holler from there. He'll be all right. Uh, what up? Come, yeah, come on up, sir. Yeah, if you can get him in a thing. Sister Janie, please excuse us. We're, we're winding down. We're, we're not going to have anyone here to help me clean that. Oh, okay. We need to cut out. Okay. All right. All right. All right. So go ahead. Just quickly, brother. We got to pull out. We just got to go straight out. Uh, primarily, there was a... Uh, an, Let's go. Uh, 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 quick, officer quick. from LAPD that was there. And he was on the uh, upper hill of the demonstration, and he was approached uh, as to him uh, taking pictures, at which time he uh, stated that he had a right to take the pictures and what have you. He later come down, and he was critical of those of us that was taking his picture, and he wanted to know what we were going to do with our pictures. Well, he was asked what was he was uh, what was it that he he intended to do with the picture that he was taking of us, and he made the statement that he was going to put them in the file. Oh. So uh, a, uh, another police sergeant had come up to him 
and uh, sort of chastise him to tell him that he was not actually to say that. But the word is already out, and the word is already his story. In this case, it's our story. All right. All right. Okay, now, listen up, listen up. We're going to pull a raffle real quick. Do you buy a raffle ticket, brother? No, sir. I'm okay. 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 I need somebody that didn't buy a raffle ticket. I need somebody that didn't buy a raffle ticket.